So Dennis, did I tell you that I went to the vitamin shop yesterday to pick up some supplements and things? You did not. Well, it's an interesting story. I was there and the place was actually more crowded than normal. And there was one guy who was really amped up. I don't know if he was off his supplements or if he had a little roid rage going on, but for some reason he was really angry and he was throwing things around and I got hit in the shoulder by a bottle of omega-3 pills, truly. Really? Yeah, but it's okay because all the wounds were super fish oil. Super, super... I got gotcha. you. Fish. Let's, uh, let's get deep on this episode of The Back Nine. This is The Back Nine with Dennis Williams and Josh Mora. Wow. Yeah, well, you know, I think, Dennis, there's a, when, I don't know if this happened for you, but when my older daughter was born, like the moment she was born, suddenly I had access to all these dad jokes. And I haven't lost it now that she's out of the house. Oh, yeah. We, we should probably do just one, you know, I, we talked about doing like ancillary podcasts that aren't part of the season. Yeah. We should do a dad jokes podcast because I have an arsenal that's pretty good. Yeah, I, and my girls still roll their eyes at me. But more adults, men and women, I have found are appreciative of those at this stage of life. I don't know if, if really? the super fish oil one was a very good example of that. Really? Maybe yeah. they're just smiling their way through. Through the pain. Through the pain yeah, of, of what, they're, yeah. what they're dealing with there. They never worked like trying to pick people up, you know, or flirt. They're, right. that's, a, that's a bad approach. Right. Yeah. I mean, but just gotta... general... No, you, you never. Yeah, you never needed any pickup lines. They just flocked to you. No, of course, that's right. They, I was that, smooth that, as that, silk, sultry, that sultry, deep voice, and they were like, "Josh Moore has that deep, deep voice." We tap in whatever resources voice. we have at our disposal. Right, if right. If that's the primary tool, then that works. Well, speaking of media personalities and great voices, we have Mark S. Allen on from Sacramento, yeah, an ABC 10 media personality, but way more than just ABC 10. That's how I know him because we worked together at ABC 10 in Sacramento when I was the director of sales and he was a, he still is a star on air personality there. Mark, thanks for coming on with us. You kidding me? This is an honor. I'm a big fan of the show. I've been listening to this podcast since its origin, which isn't that far back, but I love it. You <laughs> we guys appreciate it. something crazy, magical. It is organically awesome. Thank, uh, you. thank you so much. And, you know, we always have to hit people with the revelation that they're on the back nine, like you didn't know, right? But it's sort of a revelation for people because we never kind of want to admit it. But you have a great front nine and back nine story. You've been in, like, the Hollywood scene since you were really young. I don't know what age you started, but very, very young. And then a big staple in Sacramento. The morning show at KMAX for a really long time and then transitioning to ABC 10. What sort of drew you to, let's just get the origin, what sort of drew you to Hollywood? You've got a great story as a kid, just like wanting to be around like movies and all that. So so let's start there. Yeah, I, I just fell in love with the whole thought of, of making movies because, you know, it predates cable TV even. Disney used to have a Sunday night movie and one of their Sunday night movies featured this family that went on vacation on the coast somewhere and the kids picked up their dad's eight millimeter film camera and started making a movie. I was eight years old and that was the first time I thought, wait a minute, like I could make a movie? I'm going to make a movie. And I told my mom, look, I'm going to do that. I'm going to start making movies and I'm moving to California. And of course we were like an oil family. And so my mom looked at me like I was an alien, said, good luck with that kid. You're in Odessa, Texas. Have fun with that. And uh, we'll see you when you're working for dad's oil company. <laughs> and uh, but no, I like had that in the back of my mind forever. And like the two of you started doing broadcasting, went to Dallas and then Los Angeles and then ultimately to Northern California and literally fell into television by falling off of a billboard for lack of talent. I used to do all kinds of stunting and I did a radio stunt where I lived on a billboard 24 hours a day for a month. Three days into it, I fell off, broke both of my legs but was terrified of being fired. So some people put me back up on there. Oh Ultimately, gosh. they realized I was severely injured. So the fire department cherry picked me down, took me to the hospital, put cast on me, and they allowed me to go back up. And so I continued to live on there. It was a slow news week and every TV <laughs> station started coming out doing live broadcast. And it ended up on CBS Evening News and a guy named Matt Chan who had created PM Magazine was creating a youth version of that, hired me to be on a show with Lisa Ling and I started doing TV. 
there and thereafter and quickly parlayed the type of TV I was doing into television about movies, visiting movie sets, talking to actors. The good ones and the bad ones. Yeah, well, this is a, my story. This is about transition. So when I met you, you were getting a second chance, right? You were getting a second chance at ABC 10 after some, you know, your career's riding high and, and you know, whatever. We, we make poor decisions. Things happen. Bumps in the road. Uh, but was, you know, you, you had an, an unfortunate situation. And if, if you could sort of take us through that transition and how life changing was for you, because I've heard you talk about it. I've heard you say that as bad as it was, you know, every bad moment in, on the front nine or a moment in your life kind of sets you up for yeah. the good times on the back nine. Yeah, Dennis. And, you know, friends and family were sympathetic and talked about it being an unfortunate situation. But as I've told you, you know, when we've been talking one on one, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. The story goes down like this. So I don't consider myself to be an alcoholic, but you don't have to necessarily be an alcoholic to have a drinking problem. And by 2015, I no doubt had a drinking problem. Every Hollywood gala, every charity fundraiser has an event that typically has massive amounts of alcohol flowing through it. And I started to live for that part of life. I started enjoying them a little bit too much. And, you know, you're at these events sometimes two or three times a week. And for that particular movie studio or organization, this might be their one big night where they're going to let their hair down. And they tend to go big. Well, I would go big and bigger and look for the after after party. And next thing you know, you're doing two or three of those a week. And you're just really looking forward to doing those. And I just started living for the party, living for the celebration without doing any justification for celebrating. And one fateful night, I was discovered by a police officer. Thankfully, I was parked, so I hadn't hurt anybody. But I was well on my way to three times over the legal limit for drinking. And I just remember I had pulled over, indeed, knowing I needed to get a Lyft or Uber, but my phone had died. And I remember looking around, trying to find a, a cable to charge my phone with, and I'm disoriented. And there's not enough light. And all of a sudden, boom, like aliens descending on the ship. My car was illuminated, and I realized it's because there were flashlights coming from every direction. I knew exactly what it was. I knew my life was going to change at that moment. And frankly, I knew I needed help before then. And I remember, despite being absolutely you know, obliterated from alcohol, Remember knowing that this is a good thing. This is how it's going to change. And it did. I was arrested for DUI. They threw the book at me. They didn't go easy on me. I did time and knew at that moment I had to change my life. So I quit drinking, didn't have a drop for five years, incident free now for eight years. And that's the way I'm going to keep it going. But yeah, that's the moment that changed my life. I probably easily could have coasted through life being a party boy and doing TV gigs and doing my movie show. And ultimately flatlining, I probably would have died of cirrhosis of the liver. But nope, that officer saved my life that night and saved my career because infinitely better things happen. The best part about it, I wouldn't have met you, Dennis. None of that would have happened. <laughs> I'd have not been that. for that. <laughs> well, glad, Mark, that you're healthy. And, and certainly glad, of course, that as you say, you didn't hurt anybody that night. Take us. Can you take us through, I mean, you have a very positive attitude about it now, and it sounds like you did even in that moment. But there, I'm sure, were some some pretty rough and difficult times as you were conquering, you know, that uh, dependency, even if it was for a brief time in your life, that dependency that you had on alcohol. And so many of us have been touched by that, right? Whether it's us individually or people who are close in our families. Maybe you can take us through that time, how people were supportive of you and the things that they did that helped you through that time. You know, and we talk about how bad social media is often, and, and rarely do you, do you hear people talk about how great social media is. But I, I will tell you, in my situation, I turned it all off, ignored it for at least a week while I considered what I had done and how I was going to fix it. And then when I started looking back on it, people were remarkably supportive. Where I lived, Sacramento, people, and I'm not saying 100% because I also had critics who rightly so were saying this jerk should not have been on the streets. I don't want jerks out there driving drunk and I certainly don't want to be that drunk. And so those who criticized me did so fairly and well. But with that said, I had as many supporters saying, you know, he, he, he's admitted that he's had a problem. He's trying to fix this. Like, don't cast stones unless you too are flawless. And so I, I felt tremendous support both from friends, family and strangers in that way. I, you know, like I said, they threw the book at me. I had hired an attorney and that attorney said, you need to start being proactive immediately. 
and get help whether you need it or not. So I signed up for two different programs and started getting counseling and an in, inpatient outpatient program to work on the situation at hand. And I, I will say this, by the time it did go through the courts and I was ordered to have AA, uh, I, I went and AA is remarkable and saves lives each and every day. It didn't quite speak to me. However, this other court program that they put me in provided a counselor named Quinn, who I keep in touch with to this day, and this guy, his story was infinitely deeper and different. He was a recovering heroin addict, but he had the most remarkable transformative story and his words are like gold and I lean on him each and every day to stay on the right track. Can I ask you, you know, first of all, I'm a huge supporter of AA and I've gone to Al-Anon in support of friends and family members who have had problems. Can you articulate what it was that had kept you from going to some program prior to the incident, if you knew that you were struggling a little bit? Yeah, I guess because I don't, and in clinical diagnoses, when in the program that I had been admitted to, if, if you look at the, the outpatient docs, they don't clinically say that I'm an alcoholic. Prior to that, I never considered that I was an alcoholic. But that doesn't mean you don't have a drinking problem. Yeah. You can be in many ways in trouble without being a bona fide alcoholic. I didn't seek out treatment because I thought, well, I'm not like those guys. I don't wake every day shaking, needing to get a blood alcohol level going. I don't have hidden bottles of alcohol everywhere. I don't drink in private. So certainly I don't have a problem. But I did because I would say, well, you know, on Tuesday, I went way bigger than I planned on. So the next party, I'm not going to go quite as big. But then I would go as big. And that cycle lasted a, a, about a year. Then my DUI hit. So to answer your question, I think I resisted going because, you know, denial. Yeah. Whether you're in AA or out of AA, largely that's what people are going through that keeps them. Just assuming I'm not that person. I'm the other person. I'm okay. So, so Mark, then ABC 10 comes knocking, another station, because you had lost your job at KMAX. And so another television station comes knocking and you get a job at ABC 10. Was there ever was there ever a part of you that said, you know what, I don't want to be in the public eye anymore. I don't want to do this. And what made you decide to get back out there and continue to tell your story and kind of continue to be like, a, you know, it's sometimes maybe a punching bag, maybe sometimes be criticized for it. And because a lot of people might just go away, like they might just say, I, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to put myself out there. And you stepped up and then I'll get to the great things you do in the community, but you, you kind of put yourself out there still. You decided to keep doing what you were doing. Exactly. And in, in regards to CBS, I, I didn't lose my job. I resigned. Oh, I'm so sorry. Because they forced me to resign. Yeah, I <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. If I they got that wrong. Me. <laughs> yeah, but, okay. But, you know, the, the, the verbiage is <laughs> okay. you resigned at gunpoint. Um, <laughs> okay. If, if, again, that's the best thing that ever happened to me because had I gotten a slap on the wrist, I probably would have been out there on the roads and killed myself or someone else. So I, I'm grateful that that happened. They went radio silent on me for some time, so I really didn't know what my situation was going to be and assumed the worst and started cooking as many coals in the fire as I possibly could. So when they finally announced that I would be resigning, I, I had a couple of offers, the best of which was from KXTV, Tegna, because Tegna was also looking for a national program to develop, and I had let one go along with my resignation with CBS, the, the movie show, and they were interested in picking that up and bringing me on as well and when i came on and i think dennis you, you're one of the first people that i'd like really talk one-on-one -on -one in that building about this in no way comparing what i went through as someone who's lost a limb in an accident but when something like that happens to you that's going to be a part of your story and you better get ready to tell your story if you want to be authentic and transparent and i knew for the rest of my life i would be a dui offender and also let's be honest i'm a two-time dui offender had it happened three months later, it wouldn't have been as severe a charge because I was about 10 years past the first one, but not quite. So I'm a two-time DUI offender, and I knew that that was going to be a part of my story for the rest of my life. And I'd best get in front of it so that I don't become a three-time offender. And I'll tell anybody and everybody about it. And also, I knew if I'm given the gift of being able to continue broadcasting, I better not waste it, and I better use it for good. And if I'm on the air telling my story, which I do whenever it comes up, but definitely annually, I bring it up. I dedicate the day of my arrest every year 
to doing a live broadcast and a ride along with my arresting officer. Wow. We've since become yep. friends. So if I can do that, and maybe it even just saves one person from going big at yeah. one holiday party that year, then I think maybe I've saved lives and that's my purpose. We'll be right back. If you need a benefit auctioneer for your next fundraising gala, hire Eric Goodman, who's broken fundraising records all over the country. Josh and I have known Eric for over 30 years and he's one of the most passionate, energetic, and hardworking people we know. Eric's consulting strategies and successful fundraising techniques is why he raised a million dollars in 10 minutes at a recent event. Visit yourfundraisingteam.com to see a video of his work, testimonials, and then book with Eric today so your nonprofit can have a record-breaking night. So I've mentioned Three Bridges Consulting. What they do is they market your company. They lead the creative, they find the audience. What they produce, commercials, social media content, possibly even documentaries, it's long form, it's short form. One recent success story, working with a home services company in Chicago, the company that refaces cabinets. They launched a campaign in January. They had five times the revenue of their previous January and a million dollars more in revenue than in any prior month after they launched this campaign. Once again, it's Three Bridges Consulting. The number three, bridgesconsulting.co. All right, back to the show. So the other thing that happened too, though, so so here you are, you pick yourself back up, you're at ABC 10, and then your son has a terrible accident where he uh, suffers severe burns. How is he doing? I, I don't, I, I'd love to get the update on that. And that must have been, you know, it's one thing to deal with, a trauma that's your own, right? We deal with that. But there's right. almost nothing worse, I and mean, there might not be anything worse in the world than dealing with a trauma of a child of, of yours, regardless of what age. So that was yeah. pretty scary stuff. You, you, exactly. So it's that call you never want to get. And, you know, at this point, we're about five years past the the DUI, and life is going really well. The show, the, the movie show is back up and on the air nationally. The local show is going on. My family's uh, coming out of it. The the wounds have healed. I've made amends with my kids and things are going well. And my son Jackson is graduating. We've made it through the pandemic. We're about to come out the other side, but schools are still doing distance gatherings. They don't want big prom celebrations because we're not quite out of the pandemic at this point. And so some parents got together and decided to throw an outdoor prom and put together a whole bunch of fire pits for the students to gather around, roast hot dogs, marshmallows, that sort of thing. And my son was around one such fire pit and there was a five gallon gasoline can. And one of the kids decided to, you know, light the fire. Let's make it go a little bit bigger and no judgment because it, that very well could have been my son to be doing the knucklehead behavior. And certainly when I was a kid, I don't know about you guys, but I'm of an age where we were throwing fire on anything, right? playing with matches, all the stuff we weren't supposed to do, we did. So, I mean, no judgment on anyone for doing so, but one of the kids decided he was gonna pour some gasoline on the fire before he even tipped the can, the fumes ignited and ultimately caused it to explode, but directionally like a giant blowtorch and exploded five gallons of lit gasoline on my son and his friend that they were sitting side by side across on the opposite side of the fire pit. Over 50% of his friend's body, my son, not far behind that, rushed to the hospital, surgery after surgery, skin graft after skin graft. Fast forward, we're two years past that. He's had all of his surgeries. He heals like Wolverine. He lives in San Luis Obispo, just down the way, down the beach, <laughs> just a little ways. And he surfs every day. And like he said, nothing a wetsuit won't cover. So uh, thanks yeah. for asking. He's doing great. And it's a miracle. The kid has long surfer hair why it didn't wick and ignite and catch the upper part of his body on fire. We, we don't know. It's truly a miracle. There are lots of things to be thankful for, you know, in the wake of some unfortunate things that have happened over the past several years. How have you been able to find the resources and the resilience to be able to go forward into your career again? And maybe you can talk about some of the other things that, that you have been able to do that were, I think you alluded to at the beginning of our conversation, uh, that were kind of childhood dreams of yours to be as involved in the film world as you are. Well, I, I think, like I said, I, I probably would have coasted along doing what I was doing and happy with it. But when this happened, I realized I had a, a second chance on life. 
And whether my broadcasting career came back or not, I wanted to seize the opportunity to try to do some things that I'd always wanted to do. So first and foremost, and I recommend this to everybody, I eliminated all bad habits, not just drinking, but anything that I was doing that was holding me back, whether that was binge watching bad TV or taking too much time distracted by other things, got it all out of my life and started focusing on doing what I wanted to do started networking and a good friend of mine that used to be my segment editor back at the CBS show, this guy named Joe Carnahan. And I had helped him early on with his first movie and we remained best of friends. And he's a huge movie producer now. His first and biggest movie was Smoke and Aces with oh, yeah. Jeremy Piven. I like that movie. Common, Jason Bateman. Yeah, everybody's in that movie. I called him and he said, sure, bub. If you're through sucking on the teeth of CBS, let's make movies <laughs> instead of talk about movies. And so he was going to bring me on as an associate producer on Bad Boys 3, which he was writing and directing at the time. And so I, I kind of had that coal in the fire and was, was hoping that that was going to happen. And then ultimately, it he had creative differences and stepped away from directing it and just stayed on as the writer. But my opportunity went away. But he said, you know, call Howard. And so I called a mutual friend of ours, Howard who had transitioned into being relatively successful, a very successful movie producer. He was just coming off of Mother's Day with Jennifer Aniston and Julia Roberts, a $25 million movie, five years after saying that he was going to start making movies. He made that movie. So he was doing quite well. And I said, I'll do anything. I'll work for free. I just want to learn what you know. And he gave me a tiny job as an associate producer of a film that he had in development with another producing partner named Mark DeSalle, who you would know his movies. He wrote and developed blood sport and kickboxing oh yeah which essentially oh, yeah. was the gateway to mma fighting for u.s audiences so they were working on a film a true story about nick newell an mma fighter that won the world championship despite being born with one arm it's a great true story but it just kept floundering couldn't get steamed the funding never was quite there and i said guys before we dissolve this i just want you to know i have a script idea for a script that is and an opportunity to make a film, a horror movie that we could make on the budget of what we've raised that at least might keep us going in this business until we make Notorious Nick. Before I got back to Sacramento, I got a call that they had greenlit it. And so ultimately they made my movie. It's called Apparition with Mina Savari and Kevin Pollack. It did well. And the people who funded it said, we love what you're doing. You did exactly what you said you were going to do. What else do you have? And we said, well, we have this script, this MMA fighter. And so then we made a fully budgeted Notorious Nick. We made that movie, but because I had brought in the funds, I got bumped up to senior producer on it. And then Howard and I formed a, a partnership and a movie company, and we're eight movies deep now. My last movie just won the Cannes Film Festival Best Dark Comedy. It's on Amazon. Congratulations. Right on Prime. And what's it called? Amy's Effort List. Fantastic. Can we curse on this show or no? Oh, yeah, of sure. course. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you, well, okay, you know okay. you're talking really to. isn't even a curse word. The, the working title of it was Amy's Fuck It List, spelled like bucket, but with an F graffitied over the B. Sure. And then when Prime distributed it, they changed it to Amy's F It List. I love it. I love it. You know, I'll say this about you, too, and this cannot be undersold. Mark is a start at yes guy in everything he does. So when you go, when you're running a sales department and then you go in and you and you ask him to do something like you you say can we go can you host a media thon for the children's hospital can you host a media thon for the children's hospital and he says yep i sure can and spends a good chunk of his time giving back to that community in in sacramento and i'm sure elsewhere too but anytime you ask him to do something charitable or give back to the community you always stepped up and and i won't forget that i won't forget that you were the one that always said you know always paying it forward well, like my aunt used to always say, a pulse is a purpose. And so the fact that I got to wake up today and on top of that, get to be a broadcaster. And I, I still consider it such a privilege to be able to give it a moment of time on a broadcast signal. And I don't think you should waste that and to have the opportunity to make it, to use it for good. And if throwing my likeness, and I, I've always said, like, I've got no talent in the world, but I've been doing this for so long. It's like, you could put a chair on TV for as long as people go, hey, take my picture with this chair. I know that chair. <laughs> take my picture. So I hate to call it celebrity, but when you have been doing it long enough to have just kind of that, that, that imprint, use it for good. And the fact that you would ask me to host something just gave me an opportunity to, to make it all make sense. And I, I'm grateful for that. 
Well, thank you so much. As I said to Josh when we were talking about having you on, you are a story of resilience. You are a story of comebacks. And I'm just so happy for you. And I'm so glad we said this too. One of the great things about this show is to reconnect with people. You're like, you know, I haven't talked to that person in, in way too long. And I'm just grateful, Mark, that you and I have reconnected and we'll take it from here. and We won't make it so long the next time for sure. It's so great to reconnect with you, Dennis and Josh. An honor to hang out on this show. What you have going on is truly lightning in a bottle. This show has such organic outreach, and I can't wait to see or hear who you have on next. And keep it going, and nothing short of an honor being here. Thanks Thank so much, friend. Mark. Take care, buddy. Well, you know, the the vanity that we get from that phrase at the end of the side, <laughs> uh, and, and he was a great guest. You know, a couple of things that, that immediately come to mind. One is the importance, you know, we talk about we are in an era of cancel culture. And if that had happened to him now, as opposed to five years ago, he would never have gotten the op- or 10 years, whatever it was, he would not have gotten the opportunity to do what he is doing now, which is a not his successful career, his post incident career, but also the ability to give back and to learn from his mistakes and to provide an outlet and resources for those who are struggling with something and to turn something that was negative into a positive. And I think one of the reasons he was able to do that was because he was able to look at himself and face the issues head on and not deny and say, I know this is a problem. If, I'm, if I've been arrested for DUI, that's a problem. If I'm going out three times a week and going that hard, that's a problem. Not being in denial, recognizing that if something like that is happening, if friends are coming to you and saying, hey, your behavior is erratic, you're doing too much, that's really important for anybody who's going to get through that kind of situation, as well as going to the actual resources, the AA or whatever the other program was, or rehab of any kind, that's the only way to get through substance abuse issues. I think what you said, too, is so important that in our cancel culture, we need to take a step back and think about giving people second chances, giving them another look because of the good that they can do, right? Yes. If you give somebody a second chance, who knows, rather than cancel them, if they're truly remorseful, if they're truly remorseful and they truly know they made a mistake, it's time for us to step back and say, okay— you're going to get a second chance. Now make the most of this. And has could anybody have made the uh, most of his second chance better than Marcus Allen? I mean, it's really an astonishingly inspiring story for me. And I, I love the fact that he also talked about, you know, he checked himself, not just the drinking, but all of his bad habits. Yeah. He sort of said, he, he sort of took a, a real self-awareness, self-reflection and said, man, that wasn't the only issue I had. Boom, 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 boom. I got to fix this. His family's better. His job's better. All these things. He ma- he's making all the... He's doing what he dreamt of doing. He's made eight movies. I mean, it's inspirational. I would add, too, the programs work, and it's the only thing that works, whether it's Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. If you are around somebody who's having an issue, even if they won't go to some program, go to Al-Anon. That's for friends and family. And so you can deal with your own issues of how you might be enabling or not providing a resource for somebody. I can't stress that enough. If you have someone who's in trouble, a friend, a family member, to even do that much and to encourage them to get to the programs because that's the way so that you don't have to have it happen. You know, he was lucky. He was lucky that he didn't hurt anybody. He was lucky that he didn't hurt himself. And he was good because he followed up with it and went and got the help that he needed. And so I'm a firm, having had people around me who have had some issues, it was really important for me to go to Al-Anon and support them. And hopefully it has helped them. It certainly helped me. And so I'm a huge advocate of that for people who are struggling with substance abuse issues. And how great is it that he celebrates the arresting officer by every single year on the anniversary going on a ride with him to mention what happened to him and remind people what happened with him and potentially save lives. I mean, that alone, when we think about people in our current political situation or anything that aren't accountable for what they do, whether it's, you know, legal issues or whatever. There's so many things out there that we see now where people don't stand up and aren't accountable. And it's nice to see somebody who is. And I think that the message I would give to our audience is there's life on the other side of it if you can do that. And that's you can access your back nine if you can do that and get rid of all of these things that have been holding you back from the things that you really want to accomplish in your life. There's still time. Absolutely. So congratulations, Mark. Thank you. I'm so glad he was able to join us. So glad that you were able to join us here on the Back Nine. We'll talk to you soon. 
Thanks for teeing it up with Josh and me on the Back Nine podcast. We would be eternally grateful if you could download and follow us on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts and leave a five-star rating. The Back Nine is attested to by Janine Stella and recorded at Pixelwork Studios in Delray Beach, Florida.